You're sitting in a Mad Men style conference room meeting. As he takes a drag from a cigarette, the Don Draper-esque head of creative at the head of the table finally speaks. If you don't like what they're saying, change the conversation. After a long moment of silence, some young marketing team member pipes up from the corner. Well, uh, what if we made a new company, one that didn't sell tobacco or anything at all? The head of creative closes the pad folio in front of him, stands and walks towards the door. But just before he reaches said door, he turns and looks over his shoulder and says, Someone give that kid a promotion. Today on Pass Gas, how and why did a major tobacco company exist without selling any products or services while still serving as the title sponsor for the Scuderia Ferrari Formula One team? How did a cigarette company play a key role in building the NASCAR empire? And how did a former CEO of Marlboro Cigarettes become the head of both Ferrari and Ferrari Racing? Today on Pass Gas, the crazy story of how, for decades, tobacco and racing have been as inseparable as, well, tobacco and cancer. Past Gas Podcast. It's about cars, it's not about ports. This episode brought to you by the Past Gas Council for podcasting that is definitely not funded by Big Tobacco. COVID spring break is right around the corner, and you know what that means. Spring breaking your pants. Manscaped is here to ensure that the party in your pants never stops. Even Verona Corningstone wouldn't say no to this pants party. For everyone preparing for a pants party this spring break, I have an exclusive 20% off discount. Use gas20 at manscaped.com. Manscaped is dedicating to help you level up your full body grooming game. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 3.0, which is a waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine. I know a lot of guys who think they know how to groom themselves, but they don't. This is for those people. This is hands down the best trimmer on the market for those in need of a chest or ball shave. It features a cutting edge, no pun intended, ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. Be sure to use their Crop Cleanser Body Wash to keep your hair and skin feeling healthy and fresh. And inside the perfect package, you'll also find the Manscaped Crop Preserver, an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. You'll also find the Crop Reviver Ball Toner, which is a spray-on testy toner that's designed to give your boys a little slice of heaven. And for a limited time, subscribers get two free gifts, the Shed Travel Bag, which is a $39 value, and the patented High Performance Reduced Chafing Manscaped Boxers, which honestly are great. I wear them all the time. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping plus two free gifts at manscaped.com if you use the code GAS20. Say aloha to your new beautiful balls with Manscaped. Hey, I just want to give a quick thank you to our sponsor this week, Amazon Pharmacy. That's right. Amazon is in the pharmacy game now, and it's easier than ever to get your medications. Here's what you do. You have your doctor. Send your prescription to Amazon Pharmacy, and then a few days later, it shows up at your door. How easy is that? Amazon Pharmacy works with most insurance plans nationwide and existing Amazon Prime members. You get that free two-day delivery, and you save on prescription medication when paying without insurance. So here's how it works. Amazon Pharmacy coordinates with your doctor to receive your prescription, okay? And like I said, they deliver right to your door. The whole delivery aspect makes this really convenient. It's one less errand they have to take care of during your busy schedule. I know I have a lot of stuff going on in my life. It feels like there's a ton of things that I have to do during the week, but with Amazon Pharmacy, I wouldn't have to worry about picking up any medications. It's just sent straight to me. Amazon Pharmacy, like I said, works with most insurance plans nationwide. And here's the kicker. Existing Amazon Prime members get free two-day delivery and you save on prescription medication when you pay without insurance. Learn more at amazon.com slash gas. That's amazon.com slash gas. Amazon.com slash G-A-S. Thank you very much, Amazon Pharmacy, for sponsoring this episode. Now let's get back to the show. Dear listener, welcome to Pass Gas. Sincerely, Nolan, James, and Joe. That's right. <laughs> we in, <laughs> Joined by my two co-hosts, uh, Joe Camel Weber. Yeah, loyal to my soul. I'll never leave my pad without my blessing oil. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, James Cool Pumphrey. 
James Cole Pumphrey menthol flavor. <laughs> I remember when Camel had uh, like flavored cigarettes, so kids would like them more. Yeah, they had like orange cigarettes. And... Mm -hmm. My name is Nolan Sykes. I do not have a tobacco-related um, uh, nickname. Nolan Lights. Nolan Lights. No, <laughs> I. You know, I I wore husky jeans when I was a kid. So, uh, are are there heavy cigarettes? Are there uh, thick yeah, cigarettes? Unfiltered. Unfiltered, unfiltered just like your personality. Yeah, that's right. Ooh. You never know what I'm going to say. <laughs> anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the relationship between cigarette companies and racing teams, what they did for the world of racing, how much money, how much stinking money they brought into the sport, and why it's uh, both a problem. Why well, it's complicated, okay? Yeah. That's what it is. That's what it it's, is. It's, you know... Uh, Racing has always been a little bit shady, and you got to get your money from somewhere, so I get it. It's got to come from somewhere. That's right, Joe. I think we should just get right into it. How about that? Tobacco sponsorships of sports teams didn't start with racing. In fact, some of the earliest partnerships involved America's favorite pastime, by which, of course, we mean baseball, not smoking cigarettes. As far back as 1876, when America was just an 100-year-old baby, Baseball teams partnered with tobacco companies. The whole idea of baseball cards started as a Cracker Jack prize in cigarette cartons, which led to accusations that the tobacco industry was marketing their products to children. By 1920, every team in the National League of Baseball had a tobacco company sponsorship. By comparison, tobacco sponsorship of racing is pretty recent, maybe because kids are more into baseball. 1969 was the year that man landed on the moon. It was also the year tobacco conglomerate R.J. Reynolds landed on sponsoring racing, assigning their brand Camel as a sponsorship in sports car racing. Sports cars had gained popularity after Ford and Ferrari dumped so much money overseas into their now legendary sports car battle at Le Mans. Backed by NASCAR organizer Bill France, the International Motorsports Association, a.k.a. IMSA, was formed, and within a few years, the IMSA Camel GT series took off. Teams were required to clearly display the sponsor's corporate decal on both the right and left side of the car, and the drivers all wore a patch on the chest of their suits that featured Joe Camel himself smiling and smoking while driving a race car. You know, I just realized. What's that? Is, what is Ryan Reynolds' middle name? Does it start with a J? I think it's Ryan Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's... Oh, yeah. Wasn't that from a D-list? Ryan Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> Ryan, it's Ryan Brian Reynolds. <laughs> Ryan Brian Reynolds. <laughs> okay, so he's not RJ Reynolds. No, he's not. He's too young. He, but he does own Mint Mobile. Proud sponsor. Proud of the sponsor of the show. So that kind of makes yeah. him our boss. So like, uh, yeah, yeah Ryan Reynolds is basically our coworker. Yeah. <laughs> Round Reynolds. <laughs> Ryan Brian Reynolds. <laughs> All right. Most of racing didn't start taking on tobacco sponsorships quite so early, mostly because sponsorship itself wasn't really a thing yet. Technical sponsorships and Formula One racing started appearing in the late 60s, but some more prestigious teams held out even longer. Ferrari's Formula One team, their first sponsor to be displayed on the car was the Fiat logo in 1977. Uh, we talked about this in our uh, ends, like our, our um, Ferrari versus Ford series like way back our first our first episodes but like you know the money that like fueled these teams wasn't it wasn't corporate sponsorships as we're discovering it was more like these these rich guys would like come together and create their teams like their their scuderias their stables you know they would just pool their money and go racing it wasn't really about advertising or anything it was just like hey i'm a rich guy who wants to go fast let me give you a bunch of money so i can drive your race car yeah so here is where we're seeing that shift from Rich guys wanting to go fast to rich guys wanting to advertise their company. Yeah, at a certain point, they were like, I don't want to spend any more of my money. I'll get Joe Camel. Well, for a long time, all sports kind of looked down on being paid to do them. Um, and it was like a way to just keep... Because if you <laughs> once you start letting everyone play, you kind of realize like, oh, I'm just kind of like a fat 45-year-old <laughs> guy. There's a lot of people who are better at you know baseball than i am um so like i think yeah racing's kind of the same way like it 
they look down, you know, on corporate sponsorships because it sort of, you know, evens the playing field, mm-hmm. so to speak. Yeah, if everybody can use someone else's money, then that opens a few more doors. Right. He's opened doors. That's right. In 1972, Marlboro sponsored their first team, British Racing Motors, or BRM. It turned out to be a good bet, with BRM's Jean-Pierre Beltois winning one of the biggest races of the year, the Monaco Grand Prix. That's the one you want to win. The next two seasons, Marlboro backed the Frank Williams team, or Williams, who were registered under the name ISO Marlboro. But it was in 1974 that Marlboro found their star quarterback sponsoring McLaren Racing and bringing about one of the most famous and abiding business relationships in F1 history. Yeah. this I mean, these cars are iconic. I mean, they made up a color. <laughs> my favorite color. There hadn't been a color made up since 20 BC. Yeah. That was when we invented blue. <laughs> anyway, the first the first season with the Marlboro McLaren deal, McLaren won the constructors championship and the driver's title with driver Emerson Fittipaldi. And two years later, James Hunt, who we talked about in the previous episode, known for his hard partying and sig smoking habits off the track, more importantly, brought home another championship, famously prevailing over non smoker Nicky Lauda. Thought one of you guys was gonna insert an insensitive joke nope. there. No. No. Nope. All right. We're tasteful oh. on this. Oh, you want me to say <laughs> Nikki Loud is the most famous smoker in F1? <laughs> there we go. Uh, when the next five years didn't see any major wins, Ron Dennis's Project 4 organization came in and turned things around for McLaren. The McLaren Marlboro partnership began to dominate Formula One with some of racing's greatest drivers. Nikki Lauda came back, got a championship. Alan Prost came back, or he was there. And, of course, the legendary (laughs) Ayrton Senna. Between the three drivers in a stretch of eight seasons, McLaren Marlboro won the Drivers' Championship every single season but one of them. Elaine Prost never left. They just thought that he left because he was so short and he was standing in the corner. (laughs) I'm over here. (laughs) Marlboro really leaned into their partnership, putting out ads featuring drivers smoking while crouched behind the back wheel of their cars and standing on the track looking rugged and dangerous with slogans like, I race to win, I smoke for the taste. (laughs) Which is the stupidest. (laughs) That's so dumb. Um, Hey, why do you race? To win. Uh, uh, Tangentially related, why do you smoke? (laughs) For the taste. Oh. All right. I also don't like running. (laughs) Champion and playboy James Hunt was especially known to always have a cigarette in his hand when he wasn't driving, even on the podium, which is some iconic imagery. Marlboro couldn't get enough of it. A popular winning driver wearing a Marlboro livery while chain smoking, just like baseball cards, even if the advertising wasn't specifically aimed at kids, it wasn't not aimed at the kids. By the time Hunt died of a heart attack in 1993 at the age of 45, he was out of the spotlight, having helped glorify cigarettes in his life, uh, despite the fact that they almost certainly contributed to his premature death. While F1 and especially McLaren certainly benefited from their relationships with tobacco brands, no one entity has quite as much to gain as NASCAR. Tobacco and NASCAR were a perfect fit. The American South, which had rebellion built into its DNA, was the birthplace of the modern world's tobacco industry and also the birthplace of stock car racing. Yep, I feel like it goes hand in hand, pretty natural. Yeah, when, I mean, I'm from Kentucky and we just had like tobacco fields in my town. I've never seen one of those. They smell amazing. Really? Yeah. Like, like pipe tobacco or what? Yeah, it smells like a cigar shop. From 1950 to 1971, NASCAR's premier racing series was called the Grand National Series, Hmm. which had been chosen to try and bring focus to making the sport the prominent series for stock car racing in the U.S. Under the Grand National banner, racing legends like Lee Petty, Buck Baker, and Joe Weatherly raced and won titles. In 1971, things changed when tobacco companies were banned from advertising on TV. NASCAR saw that R.J. Reynolds, a big tobacco company, had piles of money and nowhere to spend them. Suddenly, they needed a new way to use their television budget that couldn't be used to buy commercial airtime anymore. After a careful courtship by NASCAR, R.J. Reynolds was ready to drop all that cash 
to become NASCAR's title sponsor for its elite division. When RJ Reynolds agreed and assigned their brand Winston to the partnership, it became the first time a non-automotive brand was a full-time sponsor of the still rather young sport. With the deal, the Grand National was now known as the Winston Cup Series. You ever heard of it? This partnership created what became known as the modern age of NASCAR, which would see the rise of racing names even people who have never seen a race would recognize. Dale Earnhardt, Darrell Waltrip, Jeff Gordon, among many others. That first season of the rebrand, Richard Petty would win the first of five championships that he won under the Winston title for a total record of seven career championships, one of only three people to do it. It was in 1979 that the series fully entered the national consciousness as the Daytona 500, along with its tobacco-related branding, was the first major race to be broadcast nationally from start to finish. In the final lap, Donnie Allison and Cale Yarbrough spectacularly crashed into each other, but while the cameras were still rolling after their cars skidded to a stop, Allison and his brother Bobby and Yarbrough got into a fight on the back stretch. For about 30 seconds, there was a flurry of arms and a whole lot of helmet smashing as they took out their anger of the loss on each other. This broadcast, full of Hollywood-level antics, went a long way to making NASCAR and the Winston brand a household name. Imagine if the first time you see a sport, imagine if the first time you saw, you watched basketball. Yeah. Okay? Uh -huh. It's the it's it's the malice at the palace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, that's yeah. what happened with this with this race. That was people like a lot of Americans first exposure to NASCAR was like this, you know, this wasn't exactly a common thing to happen like fighting like this, but it was like yeah. definitely like yeah. sick, you know. Well, it's like it's like oh, you walk into the room and like someone's been watching it and they're, you're like, "Wait, who are, who are those guys fighting?" Well, well that guy ran into that guy. Okay. Well, who's that guy? That's his brother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's his brother. He's he's mad about it too. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. So like I said, this this catapulted it into the 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 mainstream. Like kids were probably coming coming to school that Monday. Like, yo, did you see that NASCAR thing on TV? Like, there was only three channels back then. Like, you probably saw it. So while the 70s was the golden age of the tobacco racing business relationship, it's important to note that it was a decade where the public, as well as the government, was already well aware of the dangers of smoking. In the sporting world, major organizations were starting to react. The Summer Olympics of 1984 were the last Olympics to have an official cigarette sponsor. <laughs> That's so bizarre to me. <laughs> that is a very foreign concept. The official cigarette of Olympic marathons. <laughs> But while most sports were shying away from big tobacco money, racing was doubling down. In a romance so perfect, it could be a plot of a Nancy Myers movie, racing and big tobacco had found in each other what they hadn't been able to find elsewhere. Young, fun and flashy racing found stability and deep pockets it needed to fund racing and teams. While the devilishly handsome bad boy Big Tobacco found an exciting trophy wife that could still advertise their products on television. Philip Morris International, the parent company of Marlboro, became a minor sponsor of Scuderia Ferrari and a major sponsor of McLaren Racing. By the end of the 1980s, most teams in Formula One had tobacco sponsorships of some kind. And in 1997, Marlboro ended their relationship with McLaren to become Scuderia Ferrari's title sponsor. That's so much later than you'd think. Yeah. Yeah, right? While they had been a minor sponsor since 1993, they now renamed the team Scuderia Ferrari Marlboro. Well, like, I mean, there's so many racing liveries that, you know, you don't even associate with cigarettes. But, like, mm -hmm. the Colin McRae Subaru, yeah. that's a cigarette company. Uh, John Player, the black and white, or the yeah. black and gold John Player special. Those One are of the cigarettes. Coolest. Yeah, all the cool yeah they're cool uh at low i mean when uh when they he was cool at designs. lotus cool it's designs not, it's not like the most um under or inconspicuous uh cigarette sponsorship but when Ayrton senna was at lotus he had that yellow or that gold yellow camel livery mm -hmm. just super yeah. sick yeah and again like marlboro red is like this like really cool orange color that they had to make up to because tvs back then sucked uh oh yeah so, so they had to make 
the red orange so that it would appear red on TV. That's why tennis tennis balls are yellow. So they pop on TV. Yeah, when tennis balls grow on the tree, they're actually white and they paint them. Yeah. A lot of people don't know tennis balls and limes are the same plant. <laughs> After Marlboro ditched McLaren on prom night, British American Tobacco and their brand, West, stepped in. And while they were building their relationship with their new partner, as Ferrari was with Marlboro, the rest of the world were starting to notice that maybe advertising cigarettes and tobacco in international sports like racing wasn't exactly the best idea. I did not Honestly, know that West was a tobacco company. I just figured it, I figured it was like some yeah, financial see? or like telecoms company or something Case like that. Case in point. Yep. I think cigarettes, uh, I'm not condoning cigarette advertising on racing, but I think they make more sense than alcohol. I just yeah. think that the only people that should be allowed to advertise on race cars um, is a church. <laughs> not every country, though, was on board with pressuring racing to give up their tobacco sponsorships, though. And during this time, fearing that they might lose race hosting opportunities, the UK granted racing special exceptions to new rules that were meant to limit tobacco advertising in televised sporting events. Not only was Marlboro a title sponsor of a number of Grand Prix events, they also sponsored cars and races and a number of sports, including Toyota and then Jost Racing and Group C at Le Mans, along with Formula 3 World Rally Championships, Australian Touring Car Racing, IMSA Sports Car Racing, Horse Racing, and of all things, Badminton as well. These were all nearly universally sports which took place in the UK or UK Commonwealth country. On top of all these events, the Brits found another way to keep racing contributing to their economy. As you'll remember from our Camel Trophy episode, RJ Reynolds also plastered the Camel brand all over the Camel Trophy event, the sand glow yellow paint job with camel trophy stickers created a cult-like following where collectors would try to get their hands on these low mile but camel trophy miles Land Rovers. Uh, one was on, after we did that episode, I was looking for one. And, uh, you know, they're out there. They are very expensive for cars that uh, have been through a lot. But I saw a, a new Defender yesterday and they had taken like the, spare off the back so i i couldn't even tell what it was oh weird. and so i like sped up real fast to uh <laughs> take a look at it and i was like oh that's a defender that we went to the four by far festival and drove in one of them but then this guy was going to the exact same store that i was going to like <laughs> miles away from my house so i think he thought i was following him and that's fun. uh that's my story I just want to give another thank you to our sponsor this week, Amazon Pharmacy. You heard me say it before, but I'll tell you again. Here's how Amazon Pharmacy works. All you got to do to take advantage of Amazon Pharmacy is have your doctor send your prescription to Amazon. From there, Amazon sends a prescription straight to your door. Amazon Pharmacy is super convenient. You're already busy enough. You don't need to make going to the pharmacy another part of your busy work week. Who wants to leave the house? Honestly, I hate leaving the house. Amazon Pharmacy uses the same infrastructure that you're already used to with Amazon, so it's super easy to use. And you know, now you get to skip the line at the pharmacy. It's awesome. Amazon Pharmacy works with most insurance plans nationwide and existing Amazon Prime members get free two-day shipping and save on prescription medication when paying without insurance. I mean, who wants to wait in line at the pharmacy, you know? You're, you're, you're stuck behind some guy that smells like stinky Gruyere cheese. Anyway, Amazon Prime members can save on prescription medications and get free two-day delivery. Learn more at Amazon.com slash gas. Amazon.com slash GAS. Thank you, Amazon Pharmacy, for sponsoring the show. In the 80s, American tobacco companies were equally hard at work coming up with new ways to put their products front and center in the nation's consciousness. In 1985, Winston announced the Winston Million, a million dollar prize that would go to any driver that won three of the four major races. The Daytona 500, the Winston 500, the World 600, and the Southern 500. That year, Bill Elliott won the Daytona 500. He won the Winston 500. He won the Southern 500. In the number nine Coors Ford Thunderbird, taking home that $1 million. Not expecting a driver to win the prize in that first year, Winston developed another new all-star prize called the Winston 
that came with a two hundred thousand dollar check. And then twenty five people won that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this prize changed NASCAR in a substantial way and created the new standard for hefty cash prizes for the winners. This funneled more and more funding into the sport as it continued to gain national prominence, creating more excitement than McDonald's' Szechuan sauce oh, after man, a that. Ricky Morty episode. I think that's one of the major ways that's different about watching NASCAR is they don't really, like in Formula One, like getting on the podium, like even finishing third is like a big deal. Uh -huh. But in when you're watching NASCAR, like that's not really celebrated as much. It's all about winning. It's all about getting first. It's all about winning so you can get that big check. It's America, baby. In an effort to remind everyone that they were definitely not trying to sell cigarettes to kids, Witten mm -hmm. and NASCAR also put out a series of ads featuring drivers in their jumpsuits looking badass, telling people no ID, no smokes, no exceptions. The NASCAR Winston Cup team doesn't want kids to smoke, and we need your help. <laughs> so that's clearly, so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So clearly, okay, clearly they weren't marketing their products to kids who want to grow up and be like their favorite race car drivers, or maybe they dream of being in the pit crew. There's an ad for that too. <laughs> it features a pit crew member wearing his headset and awkwardly clutching a wheel with a cigarette in his hand and the tagline real people real taste <laughs> they loudly and frequently announced that they weren't targeting kids at all but continued to put out ads that made race car drivers look bold and heroic while smoking dude it's so weird looking at these ads because like it made me realize i haven't seen like an ad for a cigarette in so long yeah but like this was such a huge thing in 1994, Dale Earnhardt won his seventh Winston Cup, and in 1998, he finally won his long-awaited Daytona 500, something that he strived for uh, just out of reach for his entire career. This pushed both him and NASCAR onto the national stage. The Winston series started seeing recognition it had yet to experience as America, especially southern and midwestern states, cheered on for the noble champion. But in 2001... Tragedy struck at the Daytona 500 when Dale Earnhardt crashed into a wall and died. The first of two fatal blows to the Winston Cup. The public immediately began to associate this tragic death of their favorite driver with the Winston Cup. Two years later, as viewership began to decline in the wake of tragedy, the final blow to the Winston NASCAR partnership landed when advertising rules were made even stricter and the partnership ended. The final Winston Cup lap was driven at the Homestead Miami Speedway with Richard Petty driving his Dodge Charger Daytona as he did in the first Winston Cup back in the day. He was followed by the owner of the winning team of that final Winston race, Jack Roush, in a 2003 Ford Taurus. Both cars sit in the Winston Museum in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, the town named for Winston Tobacco, full of parks, streets, what? and neighborhoods named for Reynolds. If you stop in to see these cars, you can also catch a movie at the Winston Drive-In, which is also at the museum, and relive the glory days of tobacco and NASCAR. Um, I just want to imagine that that 2003 Ford Taurus is just a stock Ford Taurus, and that it's <laughs> yeah. in the Hall of Fame next to this. It's sick. the one that Max bought. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in 2001, six years after Post Malone was born, international mm -hmm. attention was refocused on the dangers of tobacco. The governing body of Formula One racing, the Fédération Internationale des Automobiles, or FIA, voted to ban tobacco advertising at their races. In just two short years, however, they withdrew their decision. Just like in Hamilton, no one else was in the room where it happened, and very little was shared about why their decision was reversed. One can only assume it was the pressure from teams who had now come to depend on the funds from tobacco sponsorships. Meanwhile, the FIA was pretending to have no idea or control on what was going on. I don't know. So, there's so many racers with so many teams. How can I keep control? <laughs> Barry Gill, then CEO of a sports sponsorship company, explained why tobacco and Formula One were a match made in heaven. Quote, It's the idea of sport for sponsorship. It's got glamour, worldwide television coverage. It's a 10-month activity involving 16 races in 14 countries with drivers from 16 nationalities. After football, it's the number one multinational sport. It's got total 
global exposure, total global hospitality, total media coverage, and 600 million people watching it on TV every fortnight. It's macho. It's excitement. It's color. It's international. It's glamour. They're there to get visibility. And they're there to sell cigarettes. Uh, sir, this is actually a no smoking establishment. You're gonna Sawed off, that. you plug! <laughs> In 2003, however, things were starting to get rocky. The World Health Organization's Framework Convention on Tobacco Control banned all tobacco advertising promotion and sponsorship. They urged member countries to enforce this ban, and in Europe, most countries complied. Ferrari and Marlboro showed no sign of calling it quits and continued to show off their stable relationship while other racing and tobacco relationships broke up for good. McLaren ended their eight-year relationship with West, with whom they never saw the same success they had seen with Marlboro. F1 Racing Magazine called March 19th, when the framework was published, it's also James's birthday, racing's, racing's Black Day, because teams that were now not funded by tobacco would be at a disadvantage, and new non-tobacco sponsors wouldn't want to be associated with a, quote, tobacco sport, making it difficult for teams to get new sponsors to replace the lost funds. Then in 2006, when the FIA came out with a recommendation against tobacco, which didn't go as far as outright banning their sponsorship dollars from banking racing teams, did ban tobacco from overt advertising in racing events. Up until this point, tobacco companies were one of the primary advertisers in F1 racing. Not everyone supported this move towards general public health, though. When the FIA released their recommendation, Scuderia Ferrari's president at the time called it nonsense and continued to shack up with Marlboro. In September of 2005, they had already signed an extension of their title sponsorship agreement, which secured the partnership through 2011. While the details of this extension were not made public, F1 Racing Magazine estimates that it was worth over $1 billion in funding. It has also been speculated that Marlboro essentially owns most of the advertising space on the Ferrari cars and leases out space to other companies. Yeah, we talked about this in a Wheelhouse episode. It's a uh, Mission Winnow is like their company that doesn't really do anything like if you go to the website there's just a bunch of like buzzwords for like corporate synergy but Uh it doesn't actually say anything (laughs) yeah and also just all the imagery that mission winnow has is just basically repurposed marlboro (laughs) imagery like it's just all the same it's just a bunch of like little kids smiling and smoking (laughs) yeah yeah they uh they're they're also pouring gas into the race car <laughs> and smoking at the same time. I want to like know what it's like to work at Mission Winnow. Why do you say like that? Say like what? Winnow, Winnow is like uh, a process for like taking the sheath off of grain. Winnow. Uh, I'm saying Mission Win Now because that's the mission of Ferrari is to win now. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not the tomato. No. No. But it's Saturday. You win in the now. <laughs> Go out. Turn the lights on and race by yourself. Marlboro is very much with F1. After their extension was signed back in 2005 that would secure things until 2011, they continued to partner closely together. In 2006, after the ban on overt tobacco advertising, the next decade would only see a few substantial changes. After the Chinese Grand Prix in 2007, when the full logo was used for the last time. The teams had already been creative about the different ways they used elements or variations of the logo. Though in 2010, the barcode was officially retired from the cars and appeared only on livery after that. So yeah, one of these tactics to get around these uh, more stringent rules was to display the Marlboro logo in like a more creative way. Um, Instead of having like an outright, like that Chevron kind of logo on the car, they did this thing called the... A, a, the barcode, the infamous barcode, where mm-hmm. at a standstill, it just looked like a barcode, as the name suggests. But at speed, when it flew by the cameras, mm-hmm. because of like the refresh rate and shutter speed of the cameras, it would look like the Marlboro barcode. Yeah, it's insane. Like we mentioned the the red earlier, like Marlboro is so innovative with camera technology on their cars. <laughs> 
I want to meet that person, like the person in charge of like, well, the cameras work like this now, so here's something we can do. <laughs> and now, you're, but you're you're a cre- <laughs> you're the editor in chief at a <laughs> at an entertainment company. You can do that. <laughs> I don't know how, how the cameras, cameras work. work. Should, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't Clearly. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be the guy that knows how the cameras work. <laughs> They so the barcode was eventually phased out, and then they just started using like the mission window stuff, which we were talking about. And there's a really cool comparison on a couple of different websites where like the the angle of the M and the W oh, creates yeah. the same chevron that can be found on the Marlboro carton. Like it's yeah. it's exactly the same angle, same colors. I also want to like just bring it back, and you know, all this effort is going in to sell. Like the dumbest product. Like c- cigarettes yeah. are so dumb. They yeah. I feel like finally the veil is being pulled off of them where it's like Ugh. they don't taste good. They you can't <laughs> rest on that anymore. Yeah. They're, They're horrible you for you. Sick. Like they literally make you sick. will kill you. And they smell like <laughs> Yeah. I can't believe <laughs> like, that's the one thing I was like, whoa, I I can't believe I smell like that for yeah. 10 years. You just smell like trash for yeah. <laughs> Something very unusual did happen in 2014 that would tighten an already extremely close relationship. Maurizio <laughs> Arriva Bene, which translated literally from Italian can mean good arrival. Ooh. Fun fact, yeah. um, was made team principal at Ferrari. Arriva Bene started his career at Philip Morris, Marlboro's parent company in 1997. He worked in various roles, holding extremely long and completely corporate nonsense titles, such as VP of Marlboro Communications and Promotions, and later the VP of Consumer Channel Strategy and Event Marketing. He sat on the F1 Commission as a representative for the sports sponsors in 2011. Under Arriva Bene, their partnership contracts would be extended for another six years. Even with a seemingly endless cash flow from Marlboro, the team struggled to perform against Mercedes and their star driver, Lewis Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Another former Philip Morris employee joined Ferrari. This time, it was Louis Camilleri, the former CEO of Philip Morris and a Ferrari board member who joined Ferrari as the new CEO in July. That just sounds like Joe Camel under an alias. <laughs> yeah. Louis Camilleri. Uh, yeah, okay. Hey, <laughs> Louis <some>. Camilleri. <laughs> but having a big tobacco buddy on board didn't help the struggling team principal. Shortly before the 2019 season start, Arriva Benny was replaced with longtime technical lead Matteo Benotto. The latest iteration of the mysterious corporate relationship between Ferrari and Marlboro is the aforementioned Mission Winnow, a collaboration between Ferrari and Philip Morris to, quote, create engagement around the role of science, technology, and innovation as a powerful force for good in any industry. Oh, boy. Here we go. Instead of using the Marlboro branding, they would proceed in their agreement that that Riva Bene signed for in their newly branded partnership. After Benotto took over the helm of Ferrari, the team entered the 2019 season officially registered as Scuderia Ferrari Mission Winnow. Before the season opener, they quietly withdrew the Mission Winnow portion and used Ferrari's 90th anniversary as an opportunity to replace the Mission Winnow branding on the cars and livery after Australian authorities started to investigate how this new partnership might violate new laws in Australia. And for the rest of the 2019 season, depending on what country was hosting their race, they would switch between the Mission Winnow branding and the 90th anniversary regalia. I remember this. Yeah. It was, it was the first race of the season. That's right. Ferrari, though, wasn't the only team trying to make things work with their favorite tobacco sponsors. After a long hiatus, British American Tobacco and McLaren renewed their relationship to definitely not in any way advertised to minors, but focused on their new oral tobacco products, <laughs> a.k.a. vaping. In 2019, McLaren displayed Vues, uh, Vues, <laughs> Vues, Vues, say Vues, Vues, Vues branding on their cars and livery, where non-cigarette tobacco advertising was still allowed. And in 2020, they added their Velo branding as well. In places where tobacco advertising of any kind was no longer allowed, they would sub in other sponsors like convenience chain uh, 7-Eleven, where a lot of those products are sold. And in some places like China, they used their own nonsense corporate branding and displayed the logo, A Better Tomorrow. 
which like Mission Winnow is another weird like, hey, we're a tobacco company that focuses on technology and people yeah. and synergy. <laughs> and synergy, 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 synergy. synergy. <laughs> These companies launch a bunch of websites that look like something out of uh, Silicon Valley with overly corporate content that seems to have nothing to do with anything but use great stock photos. A brief sample of the content quote from Mission Winnow's site, Mission Winnow is an unconventional communications platform to share our journey and create a stage for constructive dialogue. It's such... <laughs> it's such... Doesn't mean anything at all. How really can you write doesn't. so many words and it doesn't have any meaning? Talent. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. Maybe the sneakiest and most brilliant aspect of Mission Winnow is their logo. Uh, like Joe mentioned, it presents an M with a reflection of the letter creating a W, representing the letters of the brand, but also creating a shape that is unmistakably mimicking the Marlboro Chevron. Look at that. A look into Philip Morris's trademark filings confirms the strategy. The logo was trademarked for use with tobacco products and was and was later revised to be used with quote heated tobacco products. In other words, <laughs> vapes. You got heated tobacco products. You got yeah. oral tobacco products. What's next, Joe? Uh, suppositories. Suppository products. I want right. to get tobacco in my eyes. Oh yeah, little. Oh yeah, like little nicotine, like. Eye drops, nicotine drops, nicotine glasses. <laughs> You're just like wired. <laughs> <laughs> so far, Mission Winnow has more or less been allowed to continue the farce of acting like it has nothing to do with tobacco and sponsoring racing teams. While the World Health Organization has continued to urge the FIA to end tobacco advertising, including threatening sanctions like preventing member countries from hosting racing events and limiting screening of races in those countries as well if they fail to comply with the ban, the president of the FAA has said that the FIA's view was, quote, aligned very closely with the WHO and has done little else. Uh, it was, uh, views are aligned very closely. <laughs> <clears throat> A study published in 2020 by Stop or Stopping Tobacco Organizations and Products noted that Formula One and MotoGP are the only major global sports that allow any form of tobacco brands from aligning with teams and events and targeting fans. They said that by the end of the 2020 season, Formula One would have made $4.5 billion from tobacco sponsorships in its 70-year history. Uh, 100 million of that would be from 2020 alone and 95 million would be from 2019 split between just Ferrari and McLaren with something close to 70 million to Ferrari specifically. The founder of the Institute for Social Marketing and Health was quoted saying, making lung cancer and addiction cool is a tall order if one sponsorship hits the spot perfectly. In response to this report, the FIA told CNN that they can't police individual sponsorship deals, but that they remain firmly opposed to tobacco advertising and stand by their 2006 recommendations against it. Tobacco money has helped build racing over the years, but teams like Mercedes prove that it's not a requirement for success. The modern era of Lewis Hamilton's dominance without sponsorship from tobacco, instead looking at tech companies as the deep pockets of racing, it starts to make tobacco look like a creepy 25-year-old who still hangs out at the high school parking lot. Ooh. There's a new class of sponsors ready to take over who make their money without spreading the leading cause of death from cancer. Yeah, instead, choosing <laughs> yeah. to be fueled by giant oil corporations like uh, Petronas. Uh, you know, that's yeah. a different kind of cancer, man. It sounded Whoa, like you were about dude. to say giant ointment. Companies. Giant ointment. Oh, companies, get big bro. ointment out of racing. <laughs> 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 big old thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this episode. Manscaped is here to ensure that party in your pants never stops. I got an extra exclusive 20% off for you. All you gotta do is use the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. Look, I'm not perfect at grooming. A lot of us are not perfect at grooming, all right? Well, Manscaped is dedicated to helping you step up your game, all right? Maybe it's gonna make you more confident. The Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 3.0, which is amazing, by the way. I use it a lot. 
It's a cordless body hair trimmer and it comes with a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine. This is the best trimmer on the market for those of you in need of a little bit of grooming. Their third generation trimmer, the 3.0, features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to advanced skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. And be sure to use their crop cleanser body wash to keep your hair and skin feeling healthy and fresh. And there's the Manscaped patented crop preserver ball deodorant, which is also anti-chafing and moisturizing. It does everything. And then you got the Crop Reviver, which is ball toner. Well, it's a spray-on testy toner that's designed to give your boys a little slice of heaven. I'm not entirely sure what that means, but it sounds great. You thought that was all? It's for a limited time, subscribers get two free gifts. The Shed Travel Bag, which is valued at 39 bucks, and the patented High Performance Reduced Chafing Manscaped Boxers, which I can tell you from personal experience are one of the best things in the box. I wear them all the time, super comfy. So go and get 20% off plus two free gifts plus free shipping with the code GAS20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping plus two free gifts if you use the code GAS20 at manscaped.com so they know we sent you. And say aloha to your new beautiful balls with Manscaped. Thanks a lot, Manscaped. As a relatively new kid on the block, energy drinks have in many ways filled the lifestyle sponsorship gap that tobacco filled for years. Red Bull found a perfect match in Formula One, which folded into their high adrenaline, high taurine fueled sports portfolio. Monster Energy was the title sponsor of what was once the Winston Cup uh, because NASCAR fans love Monster Energy. Look at their trucks. Now it's Xfinity. Yeah, now it's the Xfinity series. Mission Wino is really an attempt to continue to influence consumers, often young, new racing fans, into trying dangerous products and creating damaging lifelong habits. There's a future for racing that doesn't have to be centered around an almost comical attempt at hiding cancerous and addictive products. I'm sorry, granola doesn't make that much money, though. <laughs> Big I think that is the main problem, is that like these tobacco companies, the reason that the FIA tolerates it still to a degree is that like they, they have the money to sponsor these teams. You look at yeah. the rest of the, you look at the rest of the field and what you've got, you've got shell sponsoring Ferrari. You've got uh Patronus, which I mentioned sponsoring Mercedes and you have energy drinks and but like, like MLMs too now MLMs, but like, they're not even like huge title sponsors. Like, I mean, just this year you look at um this new season coming, like, a lot of the teams don't even have like huge title sponsors because mm -hmm. like none of these like it's amazing that like Coca-Cola doesn't sponsor right. a racing team. Yeah, because the car kind of looks like a Coke bottle. Why or not? like, yeah, or like Apple doesn't sponsor one. Or McDonald's. 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 Yeah. What is a McFish? Uh, McFish McLaren collaboration. The Haas Gogurt car. Yeah, Gogurt. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mr. Peanut, <laughs> the Gogurt, um, one of our classic bits. Um, <laughs> Preparation H, hit up yeah, Gross why? Gene. He's looking for a team. <laughs> but like, even this problem is spreading through NASCAR too. Like, a lot of these teams now are sponsored by like banking firms. It's like I don't give a shit about some like hedge fund sponsoring a team. Yeah. I want to see. I want to see a brand that I recognize. You know? Yeah. Did I you see like, the new Aston Martin car? They just revealed it. it looks pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, but it's like okay, Aston Martin, like. Again, like I want to see, you know, Nike, you know <laughs> Nike. Yeah, I want to see the I want to see the freaking Air Jordan logo on Bubba Wallace's car, which should yeah. happen soon. I think this season it's gonna happen at some it'll point. It'll happen this season. It'll sure. happen at some point. Racing will always seek out wealthy partnerships. They have to. Racing is an unbelievably expensive sport, and tobacco will keep leveraging that to find new ways to stay one step ahead of regulators. They will continue to seek out new ways to skirt regulations and keep their brands closely intertwined. As it gets harder and harder for tobacco companies to advertise, the existing opportunities only get more crucial to their marketing strategies and lucrative for those who offer them. Turns out, money is just as addictive as tobacco, and racing doesn't know how to quit. Ooh, I can relate. Never yeah. stop hustling. <laughs> hustler mindset that's the hustle mindset dude you gotta have it um yeah i just think like i going back to our discussion like i think like there's got to be more big companies besides tobacco that can put their logos on cars the companies that we'd like yeah. you know 
I'm trying to think of products that 600 million people can afford to buy though. Cause like, you know, watches are popular in racing, but that's only cause car guys love watches. Also, for some nobody, reason. nobody buys watches anymore. Cause we have phones. Yeah. I mean, tell that to, um, wristwatch mafia or whatever it's called. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, yeah, I think Coke would be a great F1 sponsor because everyone around the world can go and buy a Coke for a dollar. Yeah, I like McDonald's. Yeah. McDonald's. I want McDonald's car. I want, I want to see McLaren and McDonald's together. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Earlier in the episode, I said that Xfinity was a title sponsor for the NASCAR Cup Series. The title sponsor for the NASCAR Cup Series is actually the NASCAR Cup Series. Uh, the Xfinity Series is the, the feeder series to the Cup Series. Oh, oh okay. To the cup. So now that they don't even have they don't even have a title sponsor. Which I think I like. Yeah, I want McLaren and McDonald's to be battling it out with Mercedes Burger King. I think a great <laughs> example is uh Kyle Bush's M and M's sponsorship. Oh great yeah. sponsorship. That's great. Yeah. And he has he get he gets a cool nickname out of it. You know what they call mm -hmm. him? The candy man. Oh yeah. nice. You know That's who sick. loves him? Kids. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, thank you very much for listening to Past Gas. Um, don't don't smoke. No, don't, don't smoke. smoke. It's, if for no other reason, because you'll smell like. <laughs> yeah. I hope you learned a little bit today. That is our goal. Hope you had fun hanging out with us. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to uh, the Past Gas podcast uh, wherever you are listening to this. It makes it way easier to find. And if you like this. Tell a friend about it because that's really the best way to get new listeners. Mm -hmm. It's our bread and butter. It's our bread and butter. Follow James Pumphrey at James Pumphrey and Joe at Joe G Weber. We got to get Joe's numbers up. Got to get them up. I Hey, maybe if I say that I don't want people to subscribe to my, or, you know, follow me on Instagram, then it'll bump things Dude, up. Dude, you're going to be doing GeoGuessr on Twitch. You got to yeah. get followers. So yeah, doing that two nights a week now. Um, Come geoguess with me. Follow me at Nolan J Sykes if you want. I haven't posted any pictures in a while. I should probably do that today. Anyway, shout out to our producers Thomas Ouellette and Bridget Davies. Thank hard you. workers as working hard as always. We we have got we got a lot of big plans for the podcast this year, and yeah. uh, our team works really hard, and they deserve a shout out. That's true. Only a shout out. <laughs> Nothing more. <laughs> All right. Be kind. I love you. Take care of each other. Keep your loved ones juiced. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs>